this, let me uh, introduce our presenters uh, and thank them for, for taking this on. Uh, Christian Orsini is the Counselor for Economic and Financial Affairs at the European Delegation to the United States. Uh, he um, uh, pr uh, previously uh, worked with the Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs uh, in the Directorate for Fiscal and Macroeconomic Surveillance of Member States. He has his master's degree in economics from the Free University of Brussels and his PhD in economics from the Catholic University of Leuven. Uh, he's a Swedish and Italian citizen. Um, the uh, second presenter this uh, morning or this afternoon is Ben Carliner. Uh, ben is a senior economist at the delegation of the U EU. Uh, he covers U.S. macroeconomics, uh, primarily fiscal, uh, pol uh, monetary and fiscal policy, transatlantic economic relations, and financial markets. He previously worked at the Economic Strategy Institute in Washington, D.C. as their director of research. Uh, he's worked uh, in New York as a North American editor for Project Finance International with Barron's Financial Weekly. He's got a master's degree in international political economy from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, has his undergraduate degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And is originally from Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to our presenters. Uh, take it away, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Todd, for the introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm Chris. Hi, everybody. I'm going to start this off, and then at one point, Ben will, will take over. Um, so before I move to the uh, economic uh, outlook per se, there are a couple of figures that I always like to recall uh, to, to our audience, and it's just about the size, uh, um, the magnitude of the, of the European Union or the Euro area, and also therefore how important they are for the US. So if you look just in terms of, of GDP, um, the EU is at, at about 19 uh, trillion US dollar is actually similar in size to that of the, um, of the US. But even the sub aggregates of the 19 countries that are using the, the Euro at 13.6, it's actually an economy which is bigger than the economy of China. Um, and uh, another statistic, I mean, of course, that the, the size of the overall uh, GDP matters, but of course for the kind of, of, uh, of goods and services that the U.S. exports to the rest of the country, what also matters is the, is the purchasing power, so the GDP per capita, and uh, in that sense, the, both the EU and Euro area are huge market for, uh, of, um, you know, the EU 500 million of relatively high, high income, definitely as opposed to, um, if you compare that with China. So, but with these uh, figures in mind, let me just turn now to um, to the economic situation and the outlook. And I'll start a bit for, on how we see uh, the global. Um, so incidentally, this is the, 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 the forecast that the European Commission has just released last, last week. Um, and, and we do this exercise twice, twice a year. Um, so in the world economy has weakened over the past, over the past year. And on the, on the left hand uh, side, um, this graph uh, can be called the, the not so good, the bad and the ugly. Um, so the not so good is, is uh, GDP, GDP growth, global growth. You see that that has been slowing down, uh, but it doesn't quite capture uh, G the, the GDP aggregate, uh, um, how some particular sectors of the economy have been doing. And we see that the industrial production worldwide has been particularly effect affected, but even more so uh, the trade volumes that have really, really plunged in, in, uh, over the last, last few quarters. So, um, and on the right-hand side, we see you know, that there is a bit of a divergence. I mean, this uh, between the, the investment, sorry, the, the manufacturing sector and the service sector with the um, slowdown in the um, a range of indicators that relate to the manufacturing sector, uh, the paper purchase manager index, uh, the net exports and employment index uh, going down much, much faster and being at overall sort of level um, indicating contraction Whereas the services have been going down, but are still, are still uh, holding, um, holding up by comparison. Um, and what is really driving this, um, uh, this, this is uncertainty, uncertainty, especially for also, if you look for the, for the Euro area here on the left, on the left hand side is, uh, is clearly um, the trade policy uncertainty. We see that the, uh, the uncertainty speaks, spe peaks up as, as a result of the, of the, the spike in, uh, in trade policy uncertainty. Um, and this uncertainty is having, um, this, it's taking its toll on, 
on the global uh, imports and uh, especially also on imports for the euro area, which uh, uh, follows the global dynamics pretty pretty closely. Um, and if we look a bit to um, look forward, uh, there are some uh, the PMI can be a, uh, again a forward-looking indicator. We see that uh, this um, uh, weakness in um, global manufacturing is uh, is set to persist. Uh, it's it's it went under 50, which is usually a, a, an indicator for a recession. Um, so we are going to expect some continuation of weakness here in the, foreign, in the, in the, in the following quarters. But we see also weaknesses uh, spilling over to some extent onto the services. And this is really uh, the, the broader framework that uh, um, has um, um, you know, inspired or, or driven the Commission's forecast for, for, the, for the global environment. So we see uh, basically a cyclical, what we still define as a cyclical uh, slowdown in the, in the US, but then overall weaknesses in, uh, in, uh, in uh, emerging and developing Asia, um, some idiosyncratic shocks still hitting Latin America, uh, but there are also in the aggregate uh, quite, quite, some, quite some weaknesses. And uh, just something that I would like to point out, you see again here, the world, the world uh, gro growth is going uh, decreasing from 3.8 from last year to 3.2 and then stabilizing. But if you look at the um, overall trade figures, we go from 4.1 to 0 0.4. So there it's uh, the, the slowdown, it's much more um, dramatic. And because the euro area and the EU is a very is a very open uh, economy, um, we are disproportionately affected by this by this global dynamics. What you see here is I uh, have um, decomposed the uh, domestic sources of uh, um, of demand with the, the and the contribution of external external demand. And what you see is actually that you know from 2017, beginning of 2017 to uh, last data uh, disaggregated for uh, the, the second quarter of 19, the components of domestic demand have tradition have actually held up. Um, uh, investment has been quite quite buoyant um, actually, and I'll get back to that point later. But the contribution of uh, net external demand, which was quite sizable in 2017 and still in, the, in, in 2018, started becoming uh, a small drag in the first quarter and then a huge drag on, on second quarter. And this is set to, uh, to continue. And uh, I have spoken about, about, um, about uncertainty and about uh, you know, the trade, um, trade tensions or, or trade wars and how this affect uh, the, the outlook uh, and the current situation. But the picture, at least when it comes to Europe, is a bit more, um, is a bit more complicated than that. In fact, we have a number of, uh, of shocks uh, that affect both the supply and, uh, and, the, and the demand. And some are, um, are sort of more temporary and, uh, and we expect them to fade out. But there are also some more um, longer longer trends at work here uh, and disentangling this is, is really not 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 that easy uh, but just to to give you a bit of um, of a flavor of, of what we mean uh, I mean on the on the short term um, we have sort of this global slowing down and the US cyclical slowdown uh, but we also have and these are really affecting more of the of the demand in the short term. But then we also have had some uh, um, supply shocks, uh, new regulation of, of diesel cars, for example, and this has been a, a supply shock, but also short term. Um, but what we move, when we move a bit more to the, to the medium and long term, in the medium term, we have um, probably something that is a, is a stru more structural shift in taste uh, away from, uh, from cars, uh, which is uh, clearly affecting some economies in the, um, in the EU um, and particularly stronger. We have Brexit. Brexit is uh, between demand and supply. Of course, it, it, uh, it, to the extent that it's, uh, it's a slowdown in the, in the UK economy, it, it will be a, a demand shock. But you know, also it, it brings about some major disruption in supply chains. So, so that's, that's also um, something to, to, to take in mind, to keep in mind. And then if we move a bit more to the, to the longer term, we have this 
the slowdown in in China, but uh, you know, again, the slowdown comes also with the with the structural change shifting away from from investment uh, and much more towards consumption, uh, and that is going to affect uh, the export of capital goods to China, which have been uh, uh, particularly important for some of our euro area euro area economies. So, the trade tensions, besides that, the, the, um, what what it creates in the short and the medium terms, there is a risk that this will uh, really uh, bring about a reorientation or, or a shortening of the global supply chain. So, so that's again, it's it's a it's a longer term supply shock, to, together with the aging and the, and the slowing down of productivity. So. Some of these, as I said, some of these weaknesses and, and trends are going to uh, to persist. But uh, if you already look at now, we see that manufacturing uh, in the euro area uh, has been very, very much affected. And um, whereas, uh, so this is in a way, it's the it's the supply side um, story of the demand component that I was I was uh, showing in the in the previous graph. Um, the, the domestic uh, uh, the sectors which are a bit more sheltered are holding up and the manufacturing is really contracting and the geographical uh, and this has also geographical uh, impact uh, differentiated within the euro area um, and uh, with the country like Germany being particularly affected as you see on the right hand panel um, and uh, here we again we, we see uh, this this weakness in, in in manufacturing is affecting very strongly intermediate goods and capital goods which are overall linked uh, very much to the to the trade volume but much less so consumer goods uh, which uh, in a way are more related to the dynamics of, of domestic consumption. And the right hand side is, is maybe what is showing is more the impact of the, the uh, sector specific shocks that I was referring to first in terms of regulation, but also the um, shift in tastes that is really affecting the um, automotive uh, sector. Again, very significant for Germany, but also some parts of, uh, of, of Italy. And we see that a bit of this weakness is, is starting to spill over, at least uh, in, in construction, uh, whereas the retail trade volumes are still holding up. So all in all, what does this mean for, for our forecast? Well, so the global environment, as I said, we see this uh, uh, as a bit of an l shape uh, recovery or sorry l-shaped dynamic here so that's a change from our previous forecast which was a bit more v-shaped now we see that the, this weakness in global demand is set to is set to remain and uh, and as i said the, the, the contribution of external demand very negative in 2019 and then will remain uh negative in 20 and abate a bit in the drag will abate a bit in, in 21. I'll skip this slide. Um, but not all slowdowns lead to recessions. And uh, I think we have seen a very um, strong evidence of, of resilience in the, in the EU and in the Euro area. Uh, we see this in, in the domestic components, which I was talking, referring to above, private consumption and public consumption. Uh, and we'll say a bit more also about the public consumption later um, and investment now the figure for investment for 2019 is a bit distorted by some uh, uh, movements uh, or relocation of intellectual property to Ireland. Uh, if we exclude Ireland, that 4.3 jump would actually be um, around about three percent so it's it is a slowdown uh, going forward but it's coming also from a very uh, very high uh, rebound in 2019 because um, you know, capacity utilization had fallen uh, quite below the uh, long-term long-term average. And just to say something a bit a bit about about consumption, what is really behind this resilience of consumption? To some extent, is uh, we see this also in the in the U.S. economy is the um, very cheap job rich recovery that we have enjoyed so far. Um, so in the left hand side, you see the performance of uh, uh, employment employment growth. Uh, after a recession, uh, the blue line is, is the current one, and it, it's um, it's compared with, with previous uh, previous recessions in the in the euro area, or economies that used to be uh, part of the euro area. Uh, sorry, that were not that eventually formed the euro area. 
and you see that the really, first of all, it, that this, this current expansion is very long. Um, uh, and, uh, but also that the pace at which job creation has been, jobs have been created uh, is, is much uh, stronger. So that, that that curve is much steeper. And this job creation goes along uh, with, the, with the reduction in, in unemployment, uh, but also a significant reduction in that dispersion of, of, uh, of unemployment. So uh, what we had seen uh, really during the Euro debt crisis with unemployment uh, shooting up in some of the weaker countries in the periphery, we see that these countries are the ones that are now experienced the, the most significant contraction in um, in unemployment and uh, will also uh, continue to see the most significant reductions going forward. What does it mean? And I here I'll skip directly to the uh, right hand uh, uh, side. Uh, well, we see that you know um, real disposable income of, of households has really been powered by the strong employment gains uh, uh, between 14 and 2018. Uh, the employment contribution being the light blue sh um, uh, Instagrams. And going forward, we really see that that um, you know we we hope and we forecast that, that the wage growth will will keep that we have seen actually already in eighteen will continue throughout to nineteen twenty and twenty one. So we'll continue to support disposable income. Now, also something, uh, and and Ben will say more about this in a few minutes. To note is that uh, whereas the net transfers from government to households have been negative between fourteen and eighteen, so there have been a drag on uh, uh, household disposable income, they are going to support a bit household disposable income in um, uh, going forward, which is very much linked with the fiscal stance. Last thing to notice maybe is that we have seen a bit of a spike in precautionary saving in, in this year. And you can see that from the, uh, the gap that has opened 2019 between the growth rate of disposable income and consumption. Uh, but overall saving rates is now, is now high. And uh, of course there was a normal reaction to this height and uncertainties to jack up uh, the saving rate. But uh, um, given the, the solidity also of the household's balance sheet, we expect going forward that consumption will grow on par with real disposable income. And here I pass over to Ben. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Um, so I think that was a good summary. I mean, you know, just, just very quickly, I think the story, the, the broad story in Europe is very similar to the story in the United States. You've had uh, this big slowdown in global growth driven uh, in large part by, by trade conflicts and, and a fall in, in imports and exports. Uh, this has hurt the European manufacturing sector uh, just as it has hurt the, the U.S. manufacturing sector. Europe's a bit more exposed to that because it's a more open economy, but um, there you are. And so people are sort of now waiting to see how things play out and if the weakness in the manufacturing sector really spreads to the rest of the economy. But Europe, like the U.S., has strong labor markets, strong in income growth, so that should help. Now, let's talk a little bit about the policy mix and what's been happening there. Um, so on the left hand chart, you can see um, that for the past couple of years, um, the fiscal impetus has been broadly neutral in uh, the Euro area as a whole. That means that, um, you know, that public spending has, uh, is no longer really contractionary as it was back when we were in the sovereign debt crisis years. Um, and encouragingly, um, while not huge, fiscal policy is now starting to be slightly expansionary, and we're seeing bigger movements in some of the countries that actually um, do have the space, because as you guys may know, um, in the wake of the crisis, some European countries still have big debt loads, and because of the stability and growth pack rules, and also just because of, of good economic management, they're trying to, um, you know, get their fiscal deficits down, get their debt to GDP levels down. Whereas other countries um, have plenty of fiscal space and, um, and can use it if they so want to, to uh, boost public investment, you know, boost domestic demand that way. So on the right hand chart, you can see that uh, countries like the Netherlands are, are really starting to do more, even in Germany, um, they're starting to spend a bit more money um, and, and encourage a bit more public investment. Um, that's the structural balance that you see. So, so these are set to increase for the most part um, from 2019 to 2020. Um, it's true that in uh, Italy and Belgium, you're, you're set to see um, deficits go up as well. 
Um, in France and Spain, they're going to be, you know, pretty even. Um, anyways, let's move on to the next one. So, so what is uh, responsible for some of the movement in um, fiscal balances? Much of it comes from lower social social contributions and lower taxes. Now, social contributions are, are the European way of saying uh, pension and health uh, care contributions. Um, so these have been going down in a lot of countries, and most of the uh, movement on the on the fiscal side, the reason that it's slightly expansionary is because revenues have been coming down because they haven't uh, people haven't been having to spend as much for their pension and health care, and they haven't been spending quite as much on taxes. Um, on the revenue side, things have, uh, on the spending side rather, things have been pretty flat. But I will note that um, public investment has seen a, a, a modest increase uh, on, in the euro area as a whole, which is a good thing when you think about spending on infrastructure and things that are going to help uh, the long-term productivity and, and competitiveness of, of the economies there. Um, so turning a little bit towards monetary policy, um, as you're probably aware, the ECB uh, is, is running quite accommodative policies. We've just had a change in the leadership of the ECB. Um, Mario Draghi has, uh, his term has, has finished and he has handed over the reins of the ECB to Christine Lagarde. Um, but in September, uh, in one of his last acts as president of the ECB, Mario Draghi helped to usher in a pretty significant easing of monetary policy in Europe, there were three big components. Probably the biggest and most important one was that um, they started doing open-ended asset purchases. Uh, this is it probably had the biggest single impact in terms of financial markets um, because it meant that they, instead of saying we're going to buy, you know, 20 billion, 30 billion in sovereign bonds per month until X happens, uh, or until this date happens, rather, they said. No, we're not going to stop doing it on a specific date. Now we're going to do it until we meet our inflation target. So in Europe, it's a little bit different than the US. They do not have a full employment mandate, but rather they aim to get inflation uh, close to, but just below 2%. Uh, but as you can see, uh, or actually I'll show it to you on the next slide, uh, inflation hasn't gotten there. So until inflation gets back up to 2%, they're going to be continuing these asset purchases. On top of that, they lowered their benchmark uh, deposit rate to negative 50 basis points. That's the benchmark short-term rate in Europe, sort of their equivalent of the Fed funds target. And um, they've also, in order to help the transmission of monetary policy, because Europe still depends more on the banking sector than capital markets, um, they have introduced what's called a tiering system. So banks in Europe, just like in the United States, hold a lot of excess reserves at the central bank. And these excess reserves up until now had been um, being charged these negative rates. And so when banks hold excess, held excess reserves at the ECB, um, they would be charged whatever, you know, negative 40 basis points on their excess reserves. They've now introduced this tiering system that's designed to help encourage banks to keep lending into the markets by not taking this hit on their excess reserves. And that's something that's been important and that they could, could work on going forward. But anyway, to get back to what these charts are talking about, um, all these actions by the ECB, as long as the market's expectations about the economy, mean that interest rates are very low, short-term rates are negative across the Eurozone, and most long-term rates are too. 10-year German bonds are negative, and in most other major European countries um, have 10-year have rates that are, are right around zero. Um, on the right-hand chart, you can see how spreads um, for some of the, the most hardest hit crisis countries, and also Italy, how spreads have come down a lot over German bonds. Uh, this is, is one of the legacies of the crisis that um, spreads for countries that were perceived as riskier uh, widened quite significantly over, over German bonds. German bonds are on the, the right-hand side. Um, you can see that they're yielding you know, negative rates. In, in the other countries, the spreads have come down a lot. Um, and, and 
you know, Italy is now, I suppose, the, the, the country where there are the biggest questions, and, and but even their rates have come down a lot. Um, to get back to a little bit what I was talking about before about inflation, um, the ECB is going to keep doing this, uh, keep their accommodative policies until inflation moves back up. It has not done so yet. And uh, the forecast um, that the commission has just released sees inflation being at 1.2% this year and in 2020, and then only going up to 1.3% in 2021. So um, they've got their work cut out for them in getting inflation back up. And one of the reasons why the ECB was concerned and why they tried to do more is because inflation expectations risk becoming de-anchored uh, below 2%, which you don't want to have happen and which is just going to make it harder for them to continue to do their jobs. Um, so that was that was behind Mario Draghi's last moves and also his his um, sort of pleas to, to, to member states in Europe to do more on fiscal policy. So to sum up, um, this forecast, uh, the numbers have come down a bit. Um, you know, right now, so according to the new forecasts, the commission is now foreseeing 1.1% growth in the euro area this year, uh, stepping up to 1.2% in 2020 and 21. Um, you can see that the, the drag from net exports is, is supposed to continue over the forecast horizon. It'll decline a bit, but it'll still be there. But the domestic demand side should hold up thanks to the strong job growth and, and, and income growth. Um, for for the EU as a whole, they're looking at 1.4% growth uh, over all three years. So I know I'm running out of time a little bit here. I wanted to talk a little bit, I'll, I'll keep it really brief, about this incoming European Commission. Just as power, uh, as, as Christine Lagarde took over for Mario Draghi at the ECB, we had elections in Europe to the European Parliament um, earlier this year. And a new European Commission, who's going to be led by a, a German woman named Ursula von der Leyen, is going to take over for the outgoing uh, Commission President Juncker. And so, we're, I just want to talk a little bit about some of their priorities. They want to they want to do a lot to promote inclusive and sustainable growth. They want to deepen the economic and monetary union and they want to have what they're referring to as a geopolitical commission. So just to be clear on what all this means, um, basically it means that um, climate change has become a very important and political, politically salient issue in a lot of European countries. European voters are in favor of doing more to combat climate change. And so many member states as well as, as the EU as a whole are signing up to very ambitious agendas to reduce their carbon emissions and to invest in new technologies that will be uh, uh, more environmentally friendly. Um, so a lot of action is going to happen on that. Um, and and um, then there are also going to be some steps taken to increase European competitiveness uh, in terms of boosting investment in R&D, some of it on green stuff, but also just in, in you know, new technologies generally and strengthen the single market to make sure there is um, you know, competitive firms who can um, you know, compete on the, on the global level. Um, and in terms of deepening the economic and monetary union, there's gonna be more talk about the economic surveillance that the commission does, about the stability and growth pact and the fiscal rules about working towards deepening banking union by getting a common deposit insurance scheme across the, the whole Euro area, and even some stabilization tools like uh, increasing the budget at the EU level, having some unemployment insurance schemes and things like that. Now, politically, these are, these are difficult issues for Europe. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of common agreement on some of the more, some of these topics, but that's where they're going to be working hard on. Um, and just globally, um, you know, it's really in Europe's interest to maintain uh, a, an open multilateral trading system for the global economy. They want a rules-based multilateral order, and they are going to work hard to defend that against some of the threats that have been coming from other parts of the world. And um, I think maybe it's time that I stop. And with that, we should see if we can move to uh, Q&A. So thanks everybody for listening. And if you have questions about uh, anything from the numbers to Brexit to trade, anything you want, just uh, let us know and we'll do our best.